The Man Who Turned Lead Into Gold by the Wall Street Avenger. For centuries, human beings have been trying to pull that off without success. Then one man did the impossible. Here's his true story. His name is Paolo Pellegrini. In 2004, he was a 45-year-old, unemployed, twice-divorced father of two, living alone in a small one-bedroom apartment in Mimarinec, New York. He had a net worth of zero. He was surviving off what remained of the small lump sum alimony settlement he had gotten from his second wife. He didn't even have a TV. It doesn't get much worse than that. Paolo was born in Rome, graduated from the University of Milan, got an MBA from Harvard, then went to work on Wall Street. He was so unfamiliar with American cultural norms, he got fired from job after job. But now he was desperate and needed to find a job as soon as possible. He logged on to the Harvard Career website and saw a listing for a CFO at a small Manhattan hedge fund. Paulson and Company, owned by one of his former college classmates, John Paulson. Paolo called Paulson, who told him the job had already been filled. Paolo asked if there were any other openings, and Paulson said there was only a low-paying, entry-level financial analyst job. Paulson warned Paolo that he would have to come up with money-making opportunities very quickly, or he'd be out in the street again. Paolo said he'd take the job. Every morning, he would drive to Manhattan, arriving just before 7 a.m. Now, this wasn't to impress the boss. Paolo was so broke, he needed to park before 7 so he could get the cheap early bird rate to park all day. As time went by, Paolo just couldn't seem to come up with anything to make money for the firm. Then one day, he spotted an article by the assistant director of the FBI, Chris Schwecker. The headline read, FBI warns of mortgage fraud epidemic. Paolo knew absolutely nothing about the American mortgage market, but he knew that in the world of finance, where there's smoke, there's fire, and where there's fire, there's opportunity. This might be his last chance to come up with something that would financially benefit Paulson and company. Paolo began doing extensive research on the history of the residential mortgage market in the United States. The first thing he found out was that since the 1930s, local savings and loan banks originated the vast majority of mortgages in the country. Paolo also discovered there had been a major turning point in the mortgage market that set the stage for every disastrous event that followed. It began in the early 1980s when oil prices went through the roof and interest rates went sky high. President Ronald Reagan used the situation as a pretext to totally deregulate the entire savings and loan industry. At the signing of the bill into law in 1982, Reagan said, Well, all in all, I think we've hit the jackpot. He didn't know how right he was. The new law permitted the SNL banks to use federally insured savings deposits to finance literally anything, not just home mortgages. Hundreds of crooks, like Arizona real estate developer Charlie Keating, immediately bought an SNL bank. They were scam artists who used savings deposit money to fund their own risky real estate projects, including resorts hotels, casinos, strip malls, strip clubs, you name it, everything but home mortgages. Among the many unintended beneficiaries of the SNL deregulation law was the mafia associate Mario Renda. Long Island-based Renda became the king of the deposit brokers. Shady pension fund managers from the Teamsters and other unions gave Renda billions of dollars in pension fund money, which he deposited in blocks of $100,000, the maximum coverage for federal insurance. In SNL banks that had mob connections. In a scam called linked financing, 
Renda would order bank presidents to lend that money out to his associates. Renda would whack up the loan proceeds with the conspirators, and the loans would never get paid back. One of the leading bank supervisors at the time, William K. Black, wrote a book about the SNL crisis called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. The old school local SNL bank owners were still desperately trying to originate home mortgages legally. They had a saying called 363. They paid 3% on savings accounts, lent the money out at 6% for mortgages, and were on the golf course by 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But in the early 80s, interest rates had shot up to over 20%. SNLs had to pay 15% or more just to attract savings deposits, which was their lifeblood. In the meantime, the banks were only collecting 6% on existing mortgages. This was a formula for disaster. The only way out of the mess was for the SNLs to sell their existing low interest rate mortgages and use the proceeds to originate high interest rate mortgages. The quasi-government agencies Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bought mortgages, but cutting through the red tape to comply with their strict rules of creditworthiness was time-consuming. There was only one other major buyer of mortgages. His name was Louis Ranieri, and he ran the mortgage department at Solomon Brothers, the only firm on Wall Street that had one. Louis and his motley crew spent most of their time eating takeout cheeseburgers from a nearby deli and playing practical jokes on each other. Then one day in 1982, Louis's phone started ringing off the hook. There was a fire hose of mortgages for sale by the SNL banks. Louis began buying up hundreds of thousands of prime mortgages. He pulled them into residential mortgage-backed securities, which reduced the exposure that any one mortgage might default. This process also concealed the creditworthiness, or lack thereof, of the mortgages inside the security. Louis then divided the mortgage-backed security into tiers or tranches, which he sold to investors. The top 80% tranche was rated AAA because investors had first claim on all principal and interest payments before the bottom 20% rated B got paid anything. The top 80% tranche was as safe and sound as U.S. Treasury bonds and paid out a better return to investors. The bottom 20% double B tranche received a higher return because it was riskier and was usually purchased by hedge funds. Louis paid only 60 to 70 cents on the dollar to buy mortgages from the desperate SNL banks, then sold them for 80 to 90 cents on the dollar. Louis Ranieri was making a fortune for Solomon Brothers and himself. In the 1980s, Michael Milken was the junk bond king of Wall Street. Most of his clients were shady corporate raiders who used junk bonds to finance their risky, hostile takeover deals. Milken became famous for hosting an annual orgy for his clients called the Predator's Bowl. Milken was blown away by how much money Louis was making by pooling mortgages into securities, then selling them to investors at a huge profit. In 1987, Milken decided to do the same thing with junk bonds. Since Milken's pooling scheme had nothing to do with mortgages, he had to come up with a new name. He called his invention a collateralized debt obligation, or CDO, which, as we will see later, nearly blew up the world. In 1989, before Milken could get his junk bond CDO scheme off the ground, he was convicted of 98 counts of insider trading and racketeering and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Around that same time, Charlie Keating and a thousand other crooks who looted their own SNL banks also got busted and went to prison. The savings and loan industry could not survive the invasion of so many financial crooks. By the end of the 1980s, it had imploded and disappeared forever. Powell's research on the savings and loan crisis convinced him that the $10 trillion American mortgage market, the single biggest market in the world, was extremely vulnerable to exploitation. But he still needed to figure out a way for Paulson and company to cash in without going to jail. With the collapse of the SNL banks, someone had to fill the void to originate home mortgages for the American public. 
Enter Angelo Mozillo, CEO of Countrywide Financial, along with hundreds of other wholesale mortgage originators. These sleazy characters were unregulated middlemen who were the link between an army of a half million mostly unlicensed and untrained mortgage brokers, many of whom were former burger flippers and Radio Shack clerks, and the big Wall Street banks which actually put up the money to close the mortgages. The burger flippers and the wholesale originators inflated mortgage applicants' income by using whiteout on W-2 forms. They would only hire appraisers who agreed to substantially increase home values. They forged signatures on mortgage applications. These fraudulent techniques created what became known as liar loans. People with no income, no job, and no assets, a.k.a. ninjas, could get mortgages so long as they had a heartbeat. And in some cases, even that wasn't necessary. Volume was what drove up fees, and fees drove up bonuses, which is all that mattered. Angelo and the other middlemen ushered in a whole new era of mortgage fraud. Fraud was easy to pull off because it was facilitated by another provision of the deregulation law enacted by Reagan in 1982. For the first time in history, extremely risky adjustable rate mortgages were made legal. Arms, as they are called, opened the floodgates for the origination of tens of millions of predatory and fraudulent subprime mortgages, most of which were destined to default. This is Alberto Ramirez and his wife Rosa, a real couple who lived in Southern California. Alberta was one of millions of people who got conned or coerced by a mortgage broker into signing up for an adjustable rate subprime mortgage that he couldn't possibly afford. Alberto made only $14,000 a year, but a broker persuaded him to buy a house for $720,000. Here's the type of predatory mortgage Alberto and the other victims were offered no money down, and a teaser interest rate of only 1% a year for the first two years. The initial mortgage payment would be an affordable $720 a month. Alberto asked the broker, what happens after two years? The broker said, don't worry, you can either refinance for another two years at 1% or sell the house and make a killing. Home prices have been going up more than 10% a year. You could pocket over $150,000. What the broker didn't say was that if home values went down, Alberto wouldn't be able to refinance or sell. The interest rate would reset to double digits, which he couldn't possibly afford, and Alberto would default and lose the house. The broker sold Alberto's mortgage contract to a middleman. The middleman sold the contract to a Wall Street bank. The Wall Street banks put Alberto's mortgage payments inside a residential mortgage-backed security, along with a thousand other risky mortgages. Then he got the top tranche, rated AAA, and sold it to an institutional investor like a bank in Dusseldorf, Germany. The customers of the Dusseldorf Bank, who deposited their euros in that bank, actually funded Alberto's mortgage, along with the others, unbeknownst to them. Why did the three major rating agencies rate the top 80% tranche of residential mortgage-backed securities as AAA when they knew or should have known they were filled with mortgages which were very likely to default? Answer, they were bribed. The Wall Street banks paid off the rating agencies with triple their normal fee in return for AAA ratings. It was as if producers of Broadway plays could pay off reviewers to give their plays rave reviews. By the mid-2000s, every major Wall Street bank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Citibank, etc., jumped on the subprime mortgage gravy train. And why not? The Wall Street banks were making hundreds of billions of dollars in fees and key officers were making billions of dollars in personal bonuses. 
everybody was in on the scam, from the mortgage brokers at the bottom of the food chain to the Wall Street banks at the top. They all cashed in. Just before he got fired, Chuck Prince, the CEO of Citibank, said it best. So long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. Paolo was now totally convinced that this giant house of cards was going to implode. He was panicking that Paulson and company would miss out from profiting from it. Through the Wall Street grapevine, Paolo heard about a well-known mortgage bond salesman named Greg Lipman at Deutsche Bank, who was predicting that the housing market would crash. Greg Lipman was a piece of work. He would say things like, if you want to keep getting rich on Wall Street by moving bits of paper around to no obvious social purpose, you had better camouflage what you're doing. Paolo met with Greg and asked him how Paulson and company could make money before the crash came. Greg said, listen carefully, and I will tell you how to do it, but you need to understand the history of the financial instrument that you will need to buy so you and your boss are comfortable with it. Paolo said, I'm all ears. Greg began. Believe it or not, it all started with this guy. His name is Joe Hazelwood. On the night of March 24th, 1989, Joe was on his way to work when he decided to stop off at a local bar and throw down a couple of vodkas. That was a very bad idea. Joe was the captain of the Exxon Valdez, a thousand-foot-long oil tanker, and on that dark and foggy night, he was scheduled to leave the port of Valdez, Alaska, bound for California. Not long after midnight, the Exxon Valdez ran aground and spilled 11 million gallons of crude oil into the pristine Prince William Sound. The state of Alaska sued Exxon for $5 billion. Exxon contacted its lead bank, J.P. Morgan in New York, and arranged for a $5 billion line of credit the fee for which was peanuts. But J.P. Morgan didn't want to offend Exxon by selling off the line of credit. The problem was that banking regulations required an 8% reserve for losses be set aside. That's $400 million that couldn't be loaned out, costing J.P. Morgan about $50 million in lost interest revenue. By now it was 1994, Management of J.P. Morgan ordered its brilliant young in-house derivatives team to figure out a way to evade the banking regulations and still lend out the money. The team immediately scheduled an off-site weekend at the Boca Raton Resort and Beach Club. This was standard practice when a Wall Street bank needed to solve a big problem. In between the drinking and carousing, one of the team members came up with a solution. Her name was Blythe Masters. She graduated at the top of her class at Cambridge University. She convinced a London financial institution that J.P. Morgan would pay them a nice fee in return for their assuming the minuscule risk that AAA-rated Exxon would default on the Morgan loan. To the London firm, it was found money. This was basically a private insurance contract between two parties. But if Blythe used the word insurance, it would be regulated and reserve for losses would have to be set up, which would kill the deal. She needed to invent a new name for this transaction. She chose what would turn out to be three of the scariest words in the world of finance. Credit default swap. One of Blythe Master's colleagues and future Wall Street lobbyist, Mark Brickell, said, I've known people who worked on the Manhattan Project, and for those of us on that trip, there was the same kind of feeling of being present at the creation of something incredibly important. Warren Buffett agreed. He said, credit default swaps are financial weapons of mass destruction. The next step for Blythe Masters was to persuade the Federal Reserve run by Alan Greenspan, to allow J.P. Morgan to get around the banking regulations and lend out the $400 million based on the premise that the loan was, quote, insured. No problemo, said Greenspan. 
He always went along with any big Wall Street bank that wanted to skirt the regulations. The last step was to get credit default swaps legally deregulated by the federal government. Deregulation would allow anyone to take out credit default swap insurance, not only on their own loans and securities as a hedge, but also on securities owned by other investors. Say what? That disastrous practice had been outlawed since the 1700s by King George III. The king passed a law in both England and America that required anyone buying insurance to have an insurable interest in the property being insured, such as ownership. Before that law, pirates would take out insurance from Lloyds of London on English ships they didn't own. The pirates would then sink the ships at sea and collect the insurance. But that didn't phase Alan Greenspan, Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, and Assistant Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. They enthusiastically supported the deregulation of credit default swaps. Republican Senator Phil Graham, chairman of the powerful Senate Banking Committee, was given the assignment by the Wall Street lobbyists, including Mark Burkell, of getting it passed by Congress. Graham was one of the most corrupt people ever to serve in Congress, so he was well qualified for the job. Graham had also taken millions of dollars from the Enron Corporation, which wanted energy derivatives deregulated while he was at it. On the last day of Congress, before the 2000 Christmas vacation began, Graham literally snuck into the empty congressional chamber and slipped a 262-page amendment deregulating credit default swaps along with energy derivatives, known as the Enron loophole, into an 11,000-page must-pass appropriations bill. A few months later, Graham was rewarded with a multi-million dollar a year job on Wall Street. Lipman said to Paolo, there you have it, the complete history of credit default swap insurance. You need to buy them as soon as possible before the costs of the insurance premiums go sky high when the defaults start. Right now, you can buy credit default swap insurance on existing mortgage-backed securities for 50 basis points. That's a half of 1%, which is only $5 million a year for a billion dollars worth of insurance. It'll be like buying fire insurance on houses that are already on fire. You can't lose. Paulo thanked Lipman and raced back to the office. Paulo told Paulson what he had learned. Paulson said that before we bet our clients money, we need to be absolutely certain that what Lipman was saying about the housing market crashing is true. Paulo then put together a chart, including a trend line that tracked annual changes in home prices going back to 1975. Housing prices, when adjusted for inflation, had risen only 1.4% a year from 1975 through 2000. But for the next five years, through 2005, they soared to 7% a year. U.S. home prices would have to drop 40% just to return to the historic trend line, which they always did. When that happens, home prices will drop like a rock. People with subprime mortgages won't be able to refinance or sell. And when they reset, there will be a tsunami of defaults. Paulson looked at Paulo's chart and said, This is unbelievable, Paulo. You have found the Holy Grail. We need to buy credit default swap insurance immediately. They both felt there was only one firm on Wall Street which had the capacity to pull off a complex scheme like this. Goldman Sachs has been described as the great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnels into anything that smells like money. Lloyd Blankfein was the CEO of Goldman Sachs. He told Paulson and Paolo that for a fee of $15 million, Goldman Sachs would act as their insurance agent. Goldman would put together a credit to full swap insurance policy payable to Paulson and company in the event that some prime mortgage-backed securities owned by other investors defaulted. He said that Goldman would also arrange for a financially strong institutional investor 
to sell the policy to Paulson and company. Goldman Sachs assigned their top man to the project. Brice Touré was a 28-year-old vice president at Goldman Sachs. He gave himself the nickname Fabulous Fab. He graduated from one of France's most prestigious universities, École Centrale, before getting his master's degree at Stanford University. This is the actual Abacus Prospectus put together by Fab. Fab explained to Paulson and Paolo that it's a $2 billion CDO invented by the infamous Michael Milken. It is filled with nothing but credit default swap insurance policies. The policies are on residential mortgage-backed securities owned by other investors, which you believe will be defaulting. The last line, selected by ACA management, Goldman will hire a so-called independent third party who will officially be responsible for selecting the securities that ACA will represent to be safe and sound and therefore insurable. This makes the seller of the insurance feel more comfortable. Fab said he will arrange for Paolo to meet with the ACA people so you can give them the list of securities you want to insure. Don't worry, ACA will go along with your list because they're getting paid over a million dollars. This pie chart shows the actual list of the 20 mortgage-backed securities filled with subprime mortgages that Paolo felt were certain to default. Fabulous Fab emailed one of his girlfriends bragging about the transaction, saying, The whole building is about to collapse any time now. Only potential survivor, Fabulous Fab. Standing in the middle of all these complex, highly leveraged, exotic trades I created without necessarily understanding all of the implications of these monstrosities. Goldman Sachs was able to convince one of its institutional clients, IKB Bank, in faraway Dieseldorf, Germany, what a good investment it was for them to sell default insurance and collect the multi-million dollar quarterly premiums. Paulson and Company's name is never mentioned in the Abacus Prospectus, which was issued on February 26, 2007. Within six months, most of the Abacus mortgage-backed securities selected by Paolo had defaulted, and Paulson and Company were paid $1 billion in insurance claims. Paulson and Company would collect a total of $20 billion over the next year betting on similar deals, the single biggest transaction in the history of Wall Street. John Paulson took home $4 billion personally. The first thing he did after getting his money was to dump his wife and move in with his aerobics instructor girlfriend. Paolo Pellegrini had booked a Caribbean vacation for he and his wife. She went to an ATM machine to get $100 for the trip. She thought there must be some mistake. When she looked at the screen, it showed a balance of $45 million. This was Paolo's bonus for the year. Paolo was paid a total of $175 million by Paulson and Company for his efforts. Paolo Pellegrini was indeed the man who turned lead into gold. One thing's for sure, Paolo Pellegrini will never have to use early bird parking again. Epilogue. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy, the stock market crashed, and the entire American financial system just barely escaped total collapse. This is Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, the new Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, and the President of the New York Fed, Tim Geithner. In the second half of the 2000s, these guys were the top financial watchdogs in the federal government whose job it was to oversee and protect the financial system of the United States of America. These three stooges of Wall Street stood by as lookout men while the biggest financial fraud in history was committed right before their eyes. While the crime was in progress, they did absolutely nothing to stop it. 
After the stock market crashed, they bailed out the Wall Street perpetrators with more than $20 trillion of U.S. taxpayer money. Then they had the colossal goal to nearly break their arms, patting themselves on the back as heroes for saving the American financial system. As a reward for a job well done, they were given plush jobs on Wall Street. In their spare time, they were hired for speaking engagements for hundreds of thousands of dollars of pop, describing how they pulled off this remarkable achievement by giving away taxpayer money. There was one man in the federal government who tried to do the right thing, Jim Kidney of the SEC. Jim was the lead attorney when the SEC filed a lawsuit against Goldman Sachs, John Paulson, and Paolo Pellegrini for securities fraud. Kidney quit the SEC in disgust when the only significant player ever held accountable for the financial crisis was Fabulous Fab, after Goldman Sachs threw him under the bus. <laughs>